Dear students, in the last module we studied about ultraviolet and infrared photography. In this module, you will be able to know what is photomicrography, close-up and macro photography, how to control light direction and various light arrangements that are available. First, introduction. Making photographic records or imaging for microanalysis of various kinds of evidential objects through various techniques is a challenge in forensic science. Be it a small part of human hair, fiber or a cleverly forged document involves the use of photomicrography, macrophotography and other techniques like using oblique light, transmitted light etc. Before going in depth of the techniques, let us learn the definitions of microphotography and photomicrography. The Royal Microscopical Society states, microphotography, photography particularly of papers arranged to create small images which will not be studied without enlargement, not to be tangled with photomicrography. This is generally not required in forensic imaging. Second is photomicrography the recording by taking pictures of an image created by a microscope that is photography through a microscope. This should not be confused with microphotography. Forensic documentation often needs to take pictures of objects like blood spatter on walls, footwear impressions or innumerable small objects on the ground. Sometimes it is the less significant features of superior objects that assist as the evidence. The photographer must be imaginative, impulsive and also prepared to properly capture the pictures of these kinds of subjects with accuracy. Take pictures of all evidence at proper place or the situation as discovered before the gathering and transference to the laboratory for documentation and analysis. Photographing the location orientation, situation and relationship of an object with the scene as a whole is just as critical as photographing close-ups of the evidence. Now, photomicrography. Photomicrography is extensively used in forensic labs and other fields which require study of minute particulars. In the 19th and 20th centuries, photomicrographs, also called micrographs, were formed by linking or bring into line a film camera with a microscope, a complex procedure. Digital technology had permitted the two devices to be by electronic means synced in order to view live images in real time. Photomicrography was pioneered in 1800s and scientists rapidly appreciated that it will enable the study of microscopic matter. When forensic science started using it in crime investigation in 20th century, photomicrography turned out to be a vital tool for examining trace evidence, tiny details that can connect a suspect to a crime scene. Camera zoom lenses and microscopes based on basic principle by using magnifying lenses and sometimes mirror to expand a point while holding clear focus. Initial photomicrography comprises complex settings of cameras and microscopes. Digital technology has eliminated and eased the requirement for such painstaking device arrangement and alignments. In photomicrography, the variety of entire magnification is generally from 10x to 1000x. Total magnification will depend on the magnification of the optical setup, on the size of the image sensor and on the size of the paper print. The main aspect of photomicrography is the lighting, which comprises the kind of light source, collector lenses, condenser and correction filters. There are various different settings used for the purpose of photomicrography. The important center here is the arrangement of a digital camera and a compound microscope. Examples of consumer grade digital cameras are the Sony Cybershot, Nikon Coolpix and Canon PowerShot cameras and others. All given cameras have a serial link to a computer system and a non-removable zoom lens. 
there are essentially three different ways of using such a consumer grade digital camera to take out pictures by a microscope. The first one, a very basic and inexperienced way of taking pictures is to use an eyepiece with a rubber ring. It is recommended to grip the camera body with one hand and use manual focusing. With some practice, it is likely to take quite reasonable images with this simple setup. The second possibility is using an adapter directly mounts on the camera to a regular eyepiece. This is chiefly suggested if the optical arrangement needs a compensating eyepiece to entirely precise for lateral chromatic aberration. The third setup is same like second one. Here the camera is fixed on a photo tube. The use of a photo tube suggests the most even configuration and helps significantly to avoid vibration or camera shake. Viewing and capturing image from the camera. Instead of connecting the digital cameras video output to a TV monitor, we can also connect the video signal to a video frame grabber card, which is a part of a PC. With such a setup, a microscope can be easily used as a video microscope and record or grab images from video signal. We can also use a camera that connects a PC wire fire or a USB port. Using manual focus and aperture priority mode with the widest possible aperture or smallest s-stop number which depends on the zoom setting is beneficial along with the manual exposure mode. The brightness has to be adjusted in such a manner that exposure time of the camera is 1 by 100 second or faster. To confirm the correct color temperature using gray filters and suitable blue filters is more appropriate. The Nikon Eclipse microscopes support a nice feature that allows adjusting for the correct color temperature more easily using a special photo button on the left side of the frame. Now close up and macro photography. Macro photography is the form of photography known to be the photography of small objects. The fine details noticed in a macro photograph can deliver extraordinary information. A close up of a blown fuse can give clues as to how the fuse blew. Alternatively, clean round ends on the separated fusible link would specify a longer and less severe condition. Magnification is an important aspect of macro photography. Magnification explains the association between the real size of the object and the size of its picture on the sensor of the camera. Photographing a 3 cm, that is approximately 1.18 inches, long subject so that its image size is 1 cm, that is approximately 0.39 inches on the sensor means that the magnification is 1 is to 3 or 1 by 3 life size. Dividing the size of the object's image on the sensor by the real size regulates the magnification. At 1 is to 1 life size, the size of the object on the sensor is as higher as it is in the actual life. Macro photography is restricted to magnifications in the order of 1 is to 10 to 1 is to 1 life size. More enlargements are likely with a microscope larger than life size. Most macro lenses are maximally able to capture a 1 is to 1 life size image of a subject on the camera's sensor. It is a macro lens only if it can achieve this 1 is to 1 magnification. A low budget method to decrease the minimum focus distance is to extend the distance between the lens and the sensor by inserting extension tubes or an adjustable bellows. Extension tubes and bellows do not contain optical elements. The farther the lens is from the sensor, the closer the minimum focusing distance, the greater the magnification. A small disadvantage is that the use of extension tubes and bellows may not preserve autofocusing, auto exposure and auto aperture operation. The maximally obtainable magnification can be calculated with a simple equation that is D length of the set of the extension tubes or the bellows plus F focal length of the macro lens 
divided by f that is equal to magnification. For example, adding a set of extension tubes with the total length of 60 mm to a 60 mm macro lens will give maximally a magnification of 60 plus 60 divided by 60 that is equal to 2. By adding a teleconverter an even greater magnification can be achieved. Application of a 2x teleconverter produces a maximum magnification of 4 and 2 stops loss in light intensity. Placing an auxiliary close up lens or close up filter in front of a macro lens is another option. Inexpensive screw in and slip on attachments provide close focusing at a very low cost. Most close up lenses are marked with a plus D number in diopter unit, the power of the lens. The diopter or power of a lens is defined as 1000 divided by FD where FD is the focal length of the lens measured in mm. Thus a lens with a focal length of 50 mm has a diopter of 1000 divided by 50 that is equal to plus 20 and a plus 4 diopter close up lens has a focal length of 250 mm that is equal to 1000 divided by 4. The maximally obtainable magnification can be calculated with the equation 2f plus fd divided by fd. For example, Coupling a plus 20 diopter lens with a 60 mm macro lens produces maximally a magnification of bracket starts 2 into 60 plus 50 bracket close divided by 50 which is equal to 3.4. Next is sharp images. Working with large magnification means that the subject is only a few centimeters in front of the lens. As magnification increases, depth of field decreases rapidly. Due to loss of light and depth of field considerations, a ring flash or twin light flash can be used. It will allow us to shoot at a smaller aperture for sufficient depth of field and a fast shutter speed. It is critical to focus carefully in micro photography since the limited depth of field available isn't sufficient to mask minor focusing errors. Next is controlling lights direction. Controlling light for studio photography is placing the light in such a way so that the subjects three dimensionality can be emphasized. Lights should be always off to the side or slightly above and never on the axis. Front or axial lightning here the light originates at the camera. The best Known example is on camera flash, axial lighting especially when it is primary photography lighting source render the subject flat and shadow less. Then is side lighting 45 degrees to axis moving the light source to a 45 degree angle to the taking axis reveals shadows. This adds to the sense of depth in our subjects. Next is texture lighting. That is 90 degree to excess light that grazes a surface from a low angle it shows off the texture and structure of surfaces. Next is backlighting. Light that originates from behind the subject can be useful especially with transparent or semi transparent subject. This is useful in document photography. Then is specular lighting. Specular highlights are bright reflections of of shiny surfaces originating from point source lighting. They show up in photographs as very bright points. Specular highlights are a side effect of the main lighting source. Here are some examples. Next is front or axial lighting left shows no depth whereas 45 degree side lighting right begins to show some of the form of the orange. On the left front lighting casts a distracting shadow and creates reflection. On the right the same light was bounced off of a white card placed behind the glass achieving two effects that is pleasing backlight which causes the liquid to glow and a soft light eliminating hard edged shadows. Kindly note the highlights on the rim. Now small evidences. 
first image, this image was exposed with a ring flash on the camera to reduce harsh shadows that could be caused by the high ratio of subject relief to subject size. Next image, the distorted filament inside this scar headlight indicates that the low beam of the headlight was in operation when the vehicle encountered an obstruction. It was not possible to use a scale on the image, so the magnification had to be calculated. Include scales and references in images to enable post-process sizing and placement. First is built-in camera flash. The built-in flash on a camera may be suitable for general photography, but it is not appropriate for macro or close-up photography. The lighting from these flashes is generally too direct and harsh. As such, the camera's built-in flash should be used as a last resort for macro or close-up photography. Second is hot shoe flash. The hot shoe electronic flashes are external flash units that fit onto the top of DSLR camera. These flashes can generally be used for all types of photography. It is possible to use a hot shoe flash unit for macro photography. However, it may sometimes be difficult to achieve the right lighting. Third is macro ring light or flash. Macro ring light or flash units were originally made for dental photography. However, they are now commonly used in macro photography. A macro ring flash is a circular flash unit that is mounted to the end of the lens. They lit up the subject evenly and provide a shadow less image. As such, these are suitable to be used in poor light conditions. Fourth is double or dual or twin macro flashes. The double, dual, twin macro flash units are the ultimate flash for all macro photographers. Instead of a single circular flash unit, two flash units very similar to mini hot shoe flashes are mounted around the lens and they can be moved around in a circular motion. Double macro flash units can be controlled individually. Next is various lighting arrangements, direct lighting. It uses normal copy lighting with one or more light sources at 45 degree angles. Second is direct reflective lighting. In this, light is reflected from the object into the lens. Put the object at a 10 degree angle from the lens to film plane and put the light source at a 10 degree angle from the subject. The light source reflects at a 20 degree angle into the lens. The light source may need to be diffused to prevent hot spots. This method creates very high contrast. Third is oblique lighting. It uses a light source at a low angle, usually to mark detail through shadows in the subject surface. It is usually used when photographing impressions, tool marks and various kinds of fingerprints. Bounced lighting. Light is bounced off a white or reflective surface. The bounce surface may be positioned at different locations above or to one side of the subject to create the desired effect. This usually produces even non-glare lighting with low contrast. Next is diffused lighting. An opaque material is put between the light source and the object to diffuse the light. This generally results in uniform illumination with condensed reflections and hot plates. Results of diffuse lighting. Next is transmitted lighting. With transparent subjects, the light source is transmitted through the subject towards the lens. The angle of the transmitted lighting is adjusted from 90 degrees to 45 degrees for the desired effect. Then results of transmitted lighting. Sometimes it is necessary to pass light through an article in manner to visualize certain details. This process is called as transmitted illumination. In the above illustration, the transmitted illumination is used to demonstrate a physical match between the two torn edges of the note. Front directional or axis lighting, a piece of glass is put between the subject and lens at a 45 degree angle. The light source is positioned parallel to the film place 
and 45 degrees to the glass. During light transmission from the glass, some is reflected downward on the subject. This method is effective when photographing fingerprints on mirrors and into glasses or cups. Now we will conclude with the summary. First, making photographic records or imaging for microanalysis of different types of evidential objects through various techniques is a challenge in forensic science. Second, forensic documentation often requires photographing objects such as blood spatter on walls, footwear impressions or innumerable small objects on the ground. Third, instead of linking the digital camera's video output to a TV monitor, we can also attach the video signal to a video frame grabber card which is a part of a PC. Fourth, oblique lighting uses a light source at a low angle generally to show details by forming shadows in the subject surface. Fifth, the light source is positioned parallel to the film place and 45 degrees to the glass while the light is transferred by the glass and some of it is reflected downward on the subject.